Wonderful. Thank you so much. Welcome to Space Science Week's public lecture. I'm Colleen Hartman, Space Studies Board Director. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Gavin Schmidt. He's the Acting Senior Advisor on Climate at NASA Headquarters. He has an extensive resume of research, and he's been director of GIFs and co-authored a book called Climate Change, Picturing the Science. Now for a little more personal information about Gavin. This very day, the Schmidt family celebrates the 11th annual family holiday called hashtag Nitrogen Tuesday. Why? Well, 11 years ago, Gavin was sitting in a bar, probably having a Guinness, if I know him. Out of nowhere, the woman seated next to him turned and asked, do you know the primary composition of air? Gavin provided the correct answer, nitrogen, making up some 78% of the atmosphere. This was not the expected answer. In fact, NSF scientific literacy polling shows only about 20% of the US population knows this answer. The interchange led to a deeper conversation about scientific literacy, the importance of communication, and eventually a dinner dance. Gavin and Sarah are now the parents of a five-year-old who has herself been an attendee at National Academy's briefings. Please join me in welcoming Gavin Schmidt for his talk entitled Climate Change as Seen from Space. Gavin? Thank you very much, Colleen. That's uh, that that was uh, that was very nice. And today, yes, is indeed Nitrogen Tuesday, um, and uh, I I try and do some uh, uh, some uh, hashtagging on Twitter uh, every year for that. A little bit of uh, psychom around uh, the concept of nitrogen, and uh, there we go. Um, and uh, and it's always a little bit of fun. So if you actually want to know a little bit more about that story. I uh, just uh, just drill down into the Nitrogen Tuesday hashtag on Twitter. Uh, but I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm, I'm here to talk about climate change and particularly uh, seeing climate change from space. Uh, we, we think of climate as, you know, the average of weather. We think of it as, you know, the, the temperatures in our in our towns and, uh, and, and the, the level of the sea near where we live. But the viewpoint that we have from space that we've had from space uh, since the uh, since the beginning of the of the satellite period uh, have really uh, filled out that notion of what climate change really means and uh, and I'll try and show you uh, a little bit of what uh, has been seen and what has been concluded uh, from those observations. I mean, now what we have uh, are a, a whole suite of, uh, of observations uh, currently. The, the ones in white are instruments and, and satellites uh, that we have uh, in orbit uh, right now. Uh, some of them are not in orbit. Some of them are the Discover satellites. Uh, uh, is it the Lagrange 1 point, which is about a million miles uh, between uh, the Earth and the Sun? Uh, all of those ones along the side uh, are, uh, are in low Earth orbit or in polar orbit uh, around the Earth. Uh, some of those instruments are on the International Space Station, uh, and those are providing lots of information too. Uh, and we have lots of planned new missions uh, as these kind of, uh, you know, get to the end of their useful life um, and as we want to bring more, uh, more uh, and more interesting uh, uh, instruments uh, to bear on the climate system uh, to observe the things that we haven't yet seen. Uh, so uh, one, of, one of the problems with this particular talk is that I think everybody is kind of used to the idea that if you have uh, satellite imagery in your um, uh, in your talk, it's going to be very dynamic. It's going to be very exciting. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, and you know you you can get something like this you know this is a, this is a picture that was taken yesterday uh from a million miles away uh showing exactly what the earth looked like or looked like that day uh from from that point um and you can see the complexity you can see the detail uh but what you want to do with 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 climate though is is you need to average over a little bit of that you need to take a slightly broader view than uh than just looking at you know single snapshots uh however wonderful and beautiful they are and so 
Let me just give you uh, some of these observations that, that we can pull out of the, of the series of satellites that we've, uh, that we've had in orbit. First of all, let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, what do we mean by climate change? Why do we care about climate change? Uh, well, the planet has warmed uh, about uh, one degree Celsius, a little bit over one degree Celsius, uh, a little bit over two degrees Fahrenheit uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, this is unequivocal. Uh, this is uh, seen in land temperatures, in uh, independent data sets, in the ocean. Uh, it's, it's seen everywhere. And uh, the groups that put these things together from uh, weather stations and ocean buoys and ship measurements uh, have all kind of basically converged on this history of, uh, of, of temperature over the last uh, 100 and, uh, 150 years or so. Um, and you can see the uh, there's there's a lot of ups and downs. Uh, there's uh, there's an overall trend uh, up, uh, particularly since the since the 1970s. Um, but uh, but what you're seeing there is, is really you know the, the essence of, of what we're talking about in terms of of global warming. Now, obviously, we didn't have satellites in 1880, uh, and so uh, this is not derived from satellite data. But we do have satellites in the later part of that period, and they can help us uh, validate these uh, trends that we see uh, at the surface. Um, and so uh, if you look at the trends uh, for a more recent period that where there is overlap with the satellites, this is, these are the, this is the trends uh, in just the last 17 years uh, from one of those products uh, that, uh, that we work on at NASA. Uh, you can see that there's overall warming you know, pretty much everywhere. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a little bit of cooling in the North Atlantic. Uh, the biggest warming that you see is in, is in the Arctic. And then if you look at the satellite-derived trends, uh, from the AIRS instrument, uh, what you see is that the patterns of change uh, are, all, are, are very, very close. There's a few places where there's some differences, particularly in the Southern Ocean um, and in the land in the tropics. Um, but, uh, but the overall patterns, I'll play that again, uh, the overall patterns are very, very close. And so what we can see from space is validating what we've been able to detect uh, on the ground in terms of temperature. Um, but we don't just see things at the ground. The, 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 the wonderful thing about satellites is that it allows us uh, to look uh, through layers of the atmosphere. And one of the things that we see, and, and, and it turns out to be quite important for understanding why climate is changing, uh, is this differential uh, warming and cooling through the column of the atmosphere. So if you go, uh, if you start at the bottom uh, near the surface, uh, we see very uh, unambiguous warming. As we get higher and higher into the stratosphere, uh, what we tend to see is cooling. And it turns out that the uh, things that are causing warming and cooling in the, in the lower atmosphere and then in the higher atmosphere, uh, those fingerprints are things that we can predict and we can understand. Um, you'll see, for instance, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of volcanoes early on in the record. Uh, volcanoes cool the surface because they provide uh, a shield. The, the, the ash from the, or the, the particles from the, uh, from the volcanoes uh, restrict the sun co from coming down to the surface, and so they cool the, the, the climate a little bit. But where those particles are in the stratosphere, they actually warm the climate. And so you can see uh, you have cooling uh, below and then warming above. You can even see the solar cycle uh, as you go higher and higher, you know, the 11-year the solar cycle uh, kind of coming and going. And you can see the impact of El Ninos, uh, particularly in the, uh, the ground, but not very much higher up. So these layers of information that you see are actually providing us layers of uh, analysis and interpretation that allow us to say what is actually happening and why. So we expect that the carbon dioxide increases will cool the stratosphere. Um, we expect it to warm the troposphere. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we're seeing. But we're also seeing long-term changes. The, the Landsat uh, satellite series uh, that started in 1982 um, has been keeping track of what the surface of the planet looks like 
uh, for, for almost 40 years. Uh, and this is a great example, and th this is just one of many uh, that I could have pulled out. This is the Columbia Glacier uh, in Alaska. Um, and uh, what this is, a, this is a photograph that was, uh, that was first taken in 1989. Um, and then if you update that to 2019, uh, you can see this massive, uh, about 25 kilometer retreat uh, of, the, of the glacier uh, over that time. And I could have gone to uh, glaciers in the Andes, glaciers in the Rockies, in the Himalayas, in the Alps, in Papua New Guinea, and I could have shown you very, very similar uh, changes over time. That tells us that, that the planet is noticing those small changes in temperature. And in fact, they're not so small. Uh, we're also seeing the change in ice mass, right? We have, we have satellites, uh, which I, I find incredible. The, the GRACE satellites, uh, you can see a picture there at the top. There's, there are two satellites, uh, and they, they pass a, uh, a laser between them uh, that measures exactly how close they are together. And where they go over the planet, where there's something massive, like a mountain, they come a little bit closer together. And where they go over the ocean, which is less massive, they move slightly further apart. And by deconvolving those slight movements, you can actually make a map of what, of what the, the gravity field uh, uh, around the Earth looks like. And, and it looks like what you would, might expect. It, it's high over, over mountainous regions, it's lower over the oceans. But over time, it's changing. And over time, uh, particularly since 2002 uh, to, uh, to, to the present, uh, over time, the places where we're seeing the biggest change are in the ice sheet regions. And the maps that you see there with Antarctica and Greenland, uh, that's telling you where uh, ice is leaving and where ice is uh, accumulating. So blue is, is accumulation of ice, a uh, very slight accumulation of ice, um, and then red is uh, loss of ice. And so you see uh, around West Antarctica, the peninsula in, uh, in Antarctica, all around the coast in Greenland, we're losing ice. And those graphs at the bottom, they're telling you how much and how fast those uh, ice uh, losses are. And they add up to 150 gigatons per year of, of ice loss in Antarctica uh, uh, and uh, more in, uh, uh, more in, in, in Greenland um, and are actually qualitatively impacting sea level uh, at these rates. Uh, these, are, these are very big numbers indeed. This is, uh, this is about uh, a millimeter, a millimeter and a half of, uh, of sea level uh, every year. We're also tracking sea ice, right? So this is the floating ice, uh, particularly in the Arctic. Um, and uh, you can see the trends uh, since 1978 in the inset there. And uh, during September, which is the, the minimum ice uh, extent, minimum ice area, uh, you can see we've lost uh, huge swaths of Arctic ice uh, over that period. Uh, the September ice coverage is more than 40% less uh, than it was uh, even in 1980. Uh, and if you go back further, uh, th th these changes, these kinds of changes uh, are unprecedented in, in any historical records. Uh, but it's not just in the summertime, it's also in the wintertime. Uh, this is a year-round phenomena where uh, Ar the Arctic ice is, is, is disappearing. And we've been able to track that through multiple uh, satellites uh, with basically the same instrument uh, since, uh, since 1978. The changes in temperature and the changes in ice mass are all impacting sea level. And we can do marvelous things with sea level now. Uh, we can measure the, the sea level over the, the, the whole globe using altimeters. So these are, the, uh, these are, these are lasers that, uh, that are flying in low Earth orbit and they just kind of they, they ping down and you pick it back up again and you can tell how high the ocean is by the time that it takes for those signals to come back. And we have been tracking that since 1993. So now we have 10, 20, 30 years uh, or more of, uh, 
of, of global sea level change measured directly uh, from satellites. And, and even better, uh, we have the change in mass of the oceans from the GRACE satellites, that's an independent uh, data series. And then we have the changes in temperature uh, from the, the ocean uh, buoys, uh, and, we can and we can calculate how much the mass has changed of the ocean and how much the ocean has expanded because it's warmer, and we can add those things up, and they match almost exactly to the level of, uh, uh, of the ocean that we're measuring directly. That tells us that not only are our measurements uh, accurate, uh, they're also consistent and coherent, which allows us to really, to allow us to, to really drill down and understand why things are changing. But everything is changing now. Everything is changing in response to the changes that are going on in climate. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a map of um, uh, vegetation. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an index that's associated with, with how much greenery there is. It's not exactly the amount of leaves or something like that. Um, but it is uh, something that you can see, uh, for, in this case, from the Landsat satellites again. Um, and you can see this, this overall uh, greening pattern, but then a lot of complexity. There's places that are browning, where, where there's less vegetation uh, than there was before. If you look uh, in the center of that uh, picture, it turns out that the that the brown splodges are places where wildfire has recently uh, been important, and the bright green splodges over that same period are, are periods where there were fires, uh, but now there's regrowth. Uh, and you can see even more. You you can you can dial into to a close um, a, a, a close up into the the Mackenzie Basin. Uh, so the Mackenzie River um, goes up to, uh, to, to the, the Arctic uh, through Canada uh, to just before you get to Alaska. Uh, this little corner there, and you can, we can build that out, and we can see uh, the, the detail that you can get from these Landsat satellites. And you can see places where there's been a lot of uh, vegetation decay, uh, and in the that point B there, uh, that's because of uh, saltwater intrusions uh, because of storm surge. Right, then that and that's had a detrimental effect on the uh, on the plants there. Uh, but places over here, uh, what you're seeing is a climate change of you know three four degrees uh, Celsius in in the annual mean over this period. Uh, and so the, the the planet, the area there, um, is becoming greener. Uh, it's becoming bushier. It's becoming mossier uh, because the planet itself, this these, these regions, are warming very very fast. I would be remiss in, in not including at least one nitrogen related uh, graphic in this uh, in this presentation, uh, but we do have one that, that's exactly uh, relevant. Um, we have been uh, obviously tracking things like air pollution uh, with uh, satellites for, for many years, and the last year has been an exceptionally um, changeable one for many reasons, um, but, but very noticeably in air quality. Uh, the changes that, uh, that happen because of the various restrictions and lockdowns and, and reductions in travel meant that uh, nitrous oxides are particularly uh, coming from uh, cars and, uh, and, and other kinds of transport uh, went down dramatically, uh, particularly in, in the, the early spring last year. And so if you compare the amount of pollution uh, that we had uh, on average in March uh, over the five years uh, before uh, the year of COVID, and then you compare it to what happened last year, uh, you see a massive uh, uh, decrease uh, in the amount of pollution because of those uh, constraints. Uh, and, and you can see that everywhere. You see that in uh, it, you see that in, in China, uh, you see it in Europe, uh, you see it in the, in the US, um, and you see it wherever there has been uh, a, a big economic disruption uh, from the, uh, the COVID-related uh, restrictions. So how do we go about drilling down into the processes that are causing this? How do we go about attributing those changes that we've seen uh, to causes uh, that we might understand. 
Well, in order to do that, you need to use climate models. You need to use uh, a model that, that can run a counterfactual, like what would happen if this didn't happen or what would happen if it was twice as big. Um, and, uh, and we're still using satellite data to inform these climate models. Uh, and so it's, climate model development is, is pretty much a never ending uh, cycle, uh, luckily for me, I suppose. Um, uh, but uh, but you start off with things like the land surface and the topography and your emissions, uh, and all of these things uh, are basically derived uh, from the satellite data uh, directly. Uh, and then when you're building the models, you're trying to build these approximations to uh, processes involving clouds, processes involving sea ice, and a lot of those also come from uh, satellite uh, data, uh, particularly things like CloudSat and Calypso or the GPM satellite, which tells us something about how rain uh, forms from convective events uh, or how uh, light is reflected from, from clouds or from sea ice. Uh, all of those things become part of uh, what's encapsulated in, in the model code uh, that you put together. And then when you've built these models, uh, you need to calibrate them, right? They don't look exactly like the real world. Um, but what we're doing now is that we're using machine learning. We're using multiple uh, satellite uh, metrics of, of things like uh, radiation and, and shortwave radiation and longwave radiation and clouds uh, to try and make sure that all of those parameterizations are doing the best job that they can at reproducing the climate that we see. And then we take those models, we compare them to the observations, we compare them to the trends, and then we see if we're, if, if, if we, if we're doing uh, the right thing for the right reason. And we're looking for things like consistency and coherence of the model output to the multiple variables that we've been observing uh, from satellites. And then where we find errors, we start all over again and we improve the input files, we improve the parameterizations we retune the models and then we do the comparisons again. And that just keeps on going. Using those models though, we can do something very interesting. We can do uh, these attributions. Now, what is the kind of question that we want to ask? We want to ask, are the trends that we're seeing natural? Could they be driven by volcanoes or the sun or by wobbles in the Earth's orbit or by ozone pollution or by deforestation or by increases in greenhouse gases or increases in air pollution, right? We can take each of those and do them individually within one of these models. And then we can see which ones line up nicely, which ones match the observations the best. And so you can start at the top of the atmosphere and you can say that cooling in the stratosphere that I mentioned before, right? This is what this is what you get. The blue line is just including the human uh, impacts on the climate. The, uh, the the kind of light blue line, that, that kind of light green line, is just the natural component. And you can see the individual uh, impacts of of the sun. You can see the orange line; uh, it's going up and down. That's the solar cycle. Uh, you can see the volcanic eruptions uh, kind of popping up uh, every now and again. Uh, you can see ozone depletion in the stratosphere having an impact on the climate. But when you put it all together, which is the kind of burgundy line, and you compare it to the observations that we have, you actually end up with a very good match over the period of the satellite record. We can go down further into the, into the atmosphere into the middle of the troposphere and we can ask the same questions. The sun, is it, is it causing the trends? No. Are the volcanoes causing the trends? No. Are the greenhouse gases causing the trends? Are the anthropogenic changes causing the trends? And the answer is yes. Yes, they are. The greenhouse gases are matched and slightly uh, compensated for by the increase in air pollution, um, but the, the greenhouse gases uh, are winning, it turns out. Uh, and when you put it all together, the anthropogenic uh, trends match the trends that we're seeing uh, almost exactly. At the surface, we have a longer record. We, we, can, we can do that validation going back even further. But even there, we're still doing a good job. The anthropogenic trends are what are controlling the long-term trends in the climate right now. 
And when it comes to sea ice, it's the same thing. You know, if the, the sun is not doing it, the volcanoes are not doing it, but the trends that you see in the Arctic sea ice are almost all exactly driven by the same anthropogenic forcings that are changing the rest of the system. But what about extremes? We don't live in the global mean temperature. We don't, oh, many of us don't live in the Arctic, uh, but we're being impacted by extreme weather, perhaps on an increasing basis. So is that true or is that not true? What's going on there? So uh, we can see heat waves from space. Uh, we can see uh, heat waves with the MODIS instrument, uh, with, with the AIRS instrument. Um, and we can see, uh, for instance, this was in July 2016, or possibly the warmest month uh, in, the, uh, in the historical record. Uh, and we can see these massive temperature anomalies uh, in, in, uh, in, in Siberia. Uh, we saw very similar anomalies in, in 2020. Um, and we can see uh, if you look at heat wave uh, incidents and the, and the cumulative intensity of heat waves, how many, how many days above a certain uh, level that we are experiencing, uh, what we see is a very, very clear increase uh, in the amount of heat waves uh, since, uh, since since the 1960s. We're seeing increases in the intensity of drought as well. Uh, we're not seeing so many changes in precipitation, rainfall, uh, but where we have a drought condition, where there is a lack of rain, uh, the situation is becoming more dire because of increased evaporation from the soils, because of increased temperature uh, that, are, that is drying out uh, the ground faster. Uh, because of decreases in snowpack that is reducing the amount of river runoff uh, during the spring, uh, during the summer and fall. And so uh, we are seeing uh, maybe 30 to 50 percent greater intensity of, of droughts uh, here in the American Southwest uh, because of those anthropogenic changes. Uh, and this is soil moisture, and it's again being measured by its gravity. It's being measured by those same satellites that were tracking the mass in Antarctica and Greenland. It's the gravity of the soil moisture that we can detect at, at a ridiculous amount of precision. Uh, it's extremely impressive. But where it rains, and how much it rains when it does, we're also seeing trends. This is uh, this is a satellite view uh, that's uh, that's a merge of multiple satellite products, in, including the uh, 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 trim and the uh, the global precipitation measurements uh, of of what happened during Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Uh, this was uh, a massive rainfall event, uh, over 30, sometimes in some places uh, 40 inches of rain fell during this event. Uh, the uh, the hurricane itself was very slow moving, uh, which is something that we that we're seeing more of. It turns out, um, but when you look at this as a, an individual event and you ask like why, uh, what what controlled the precipitation? Obviously, we've had hurricanes uh, throughout history, uh, but when you put in the anthropogenic juicing of the climate and the temperatures uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the estimates come out to about twenty percent of that rain. Rainfall uh, is attributable to the, the anthropogenic change in temperatures. So that's uh, instead of uh, 32 inches, you had 40 inches. And, and maybe when you were underneath that, you wouldn't have noticed the difference. Uh, but, but the impacts from extreme events is all a question of thresholds. Uh, once you get above a threshold to flood, uh, uh, to overtop a levee or to, to flood a subway system, those are thresholds and every inch counts. Uh, and so the impacts of extreme events are actually going up much faster than the estimates of the, attrib the attributable percentage. People have been looking at that for quite a long time now, uh, and we're actually getting quite good at thinking about how to attribute a single special uh, extreme event. And uh, scientists uh, all around the world have been looking at specific events of all sorts. Um, 
heat waves, uh, rainfall events, flooding events, droughts, uh, storms, um, wildfires. And they have been doing uh, these uh, very impressive uh, attribution studies uh, of these events and this map gives you a sense of what they're finding. Uh, all of the red dots here are different extreme events where we have found a substantial contribution from human activity. So human activity has made these events uh, more frequent or more intense. Uh, some of the blue ones there, uh, and you'll notice that a lot of the blue ones are associated with rainfall events, uh, those are places where we have not yet found uh, a substantial uh, human contribution to what's been going on. And that's actually a pattern that we see. Uh, uh, events that have a big thermodynamic component, where there's a big impact because of the heat, uh, we're seeing more and more that these are being uh, made more intense or more frequent uh, because of human activity. Uh, but, the, uh, but things that depend a little bit more on the dynamics of the atmosphere, uh, that's noisier, it's a little bit more complicated, and we're not seeing such a strong signal uh, or, or a signal at all in many of those events. Uh, we're seeing reductions in the amount of cold waves. We're seeing increases in the amount of heat waves. Um, and we are finding these, these large human contributions uh, to that uh, it, uh, on the ocean and on land for heat waves, uh, the intensity of rainfall, the intensity of drought, and uh, for, the, for the pattern and intensity of wildfires. All of these things are complicated, uh, and there are lots of other elements that make up uh, any particular event, uh, particularly for wildfires. There's a lot of complex things there. But we also find that there is a climate, an anthropogenic climate change induced component to those changes. So let me conclude. I hope I've demonstrated that we can, in fact, see climate change from space. Uh, it's not hidden, it's not small, and it's no longer subtle. We can see the processes that underlie the climate also from space. Those processes are being imported and encapsulated uh, into our climate modeling, uh, and they are helping us attribute and understand why those changes are happening and for what reasons. The combination of models and observations, all informed by this unique space eye view, uh, imply that almost all the lo current long-term trends uh, in climate are anthropogenic. It's not a little bit of this and a little bit of that. The trends in temperature, the trends in sea ice uh, are, in fact, because of us. And we have increasing confidence uh, that there is an anthropogenic and a growing anthropogenic component to many uh, extreme events. Not all of them. Uh, and each extreme really needs to be looked at in its, in, in its context. Uh, but in events such as heat waves and wildfires and intense precipitation, we are seeing in event after event after event a very clear human fingerprint. Sorry about that. So thank you very much. Well, that was just fabulous, Gavin. Thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing talk and the visuals are compelling. I will now open it up to the Space Studies Board, Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board, and to the discipline committee members who are online. I want to uh, take a moment and thank Chair Margie Kivelson of the Space Studies Board and Pam Melroy of the Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board Chair. Thank you both for being here. And uh, do we have any questions? I am going to ask, uh, since people will be getting to their raised hands, um, first up for you, Gavin, uh, um, we do appear to have an aging spacecraft uh fleet yes can you speak a little bit about uh re reinvigorating that fleet and it adding newer sensors 
Um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's a, uh, that's, that's a, that's a great topic. I mean, you, you will have noticed that, uh, that a number of the, uh, the workhorse, um, satellites and instruments, uh, have now been in space almost 20 years and they're coming to the end of their useful life. Um, uh, and maintaining, uh, continuity of, of these records, uh, particularly in, in cases where you can't, you don't have an absolute calibration for what you're measuring, um, is, is, is very important. Uh, so part of the decadal survey that, that NASA, uh, goes through every year, uh, every, every decade, um, is really focused on maintaining that continuity, but then also bringing in the new instruments that we need to measure the things that we haven't been measuring. Uh, and so that's, that's a process. Um, and, uh, and as somebody who, uh, uh, who's on the periphery of some of those discussions, it's quite a fraught process because, you know, there are a lot of different competing uh, ideas for what to put on any particular uh, opportunity. Um, but one of the things that is, uh, I think, uh, very positive uh, uh, now that, that wasn't perhaps the case uh, 10 years ago, uh, is that we have a lot of international partners who are doing a tremendous amount of work uh, on measuring same, similar or, 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 or coherent things to, to what that time series that I showed you has been doing. Uh, so the, the European uh, Space Agency, the Japanese, even the Chinese, uh, the amount of uh, observational capacity that's going into space uh, or is, and is being planned to go into space, um, I think we're, we're going to do, uh, we're going to be, we're going to be okay in terms of continuity. But I think the, the key thing is going to be to make sure that the data is being shared, that the, uh, that the coherent um, uh, metrics uh, that we want uh, can, be, can be pieced together with multiple satellites from multiple jurisdictions. Uh, that's always been the case. We've always had to glue satellite records together, and that can be a little fraught. Um, but, uh, but we need to be able to do that internationally uh, more than I think that we have done uh, up until now. Thank you, Gavin. I, our next question will come from Margie Hivelson. Margie? Um, in, one of the things that is of grave concern is the extent to which climate skept, uh, change skepticism is present in, in the population. And I, I just wonder what's your experience in terms of using the space data to confront uh, the, the, the skepticism? Well, a lot of the skepticism uh, that you see is, is not really in good faith. Um, the, the main proponents of, you know, climate skeptic ideas um, are, uh, are not doing it because there are genuine questions about the, uh, the science. Um, but there's a lot of people who are confused because of because of this this uh, this back and forth, um, and there are people with very genuine questions uh, about uh, how we know what we know, how do we know that we're on the right in the right ballpark? You know what's coherent, what's not coherent, um, and I think that uh, one of the things that uh, that we've been able to do uh, with respect to to some of those genuine questions that come from people who who have, who aren't experts in this field, which is almost everybody, um, is, to, is to use this data and show how coherent our, our worldview is of, of what's going on. Uh, one of the, one of the, the, the perennial uh, climate skeptic talking points is that uh, uh, the, the changes are not due to uh, the greenhouse gases, they're due to the sun, right? But then you look at uh, these records in the stratosphere, you look at the records directly of solar intensity, all of which are being measured from space, and you say, look, we can see the sun. We can see the impacts that it has on ozone in the stratosphere. We can see the impacts it has in the mesosphere. But then you come down and, and you're not seeing those trends. The trends don't come from that. And, uh, and so you, you can piece it together. Um, and we have, uh, it's not just one piece of data. It's not just the surface temperature record. It's not just uh, the, the melting glacier somewhere. It's melting glaciers everywhere. It's temperature everywhere. It's like... Uh, now, I, I mean, I, th I think it's I think it's abundantly clear that uh, the kind of climate contrarian uh, arguments have, have become marginalized because of the, the climate facts on the ground. Um, uh, now, the people who, who, who keep using them 
uh, or keep pushing these arguments. They haven't gone away. Uh, they're still there, but they're just, they're no longer um, that much part of the conversation. Uh, and I think that uh, there has been a sea change in, uh, in how people are discussing uh, climate and how they are viewing climate uh, that is much more positive. Now, that isn't to say that we're all suddenly going to agree on what to do about this. Um, there is there are obviously important value uh, issues that, that that are in play there, um, but I think that uh, overall, um, I, I would say maybe ten years ago, you know, I, it was you know the climate scientists versus the think tanks, and you know, and everyone thought that that was the argument, and, and now we have. You know, people are saying, oh, my God, it's going to be a catastrophe. And people are saying, well, it's not going to be that bad. And then the climate scientists are kind of now in the middle. And I think that's actually that's actually a healthier um, uh, state of debate or state of discussion, uh, because this these are, you know, like the degree to which this is going to be a disaster uh, is still unclear. And so that's that's something where uh, it's worth discussing with people. Terrific. Thank you, Gavin. Our next question will come from. William Dietrich. Uh, thanks for a beautiful talk. My question is that I understand that there's a growing trend toward private sector satellites mm -hmm. and associated that access, uh, issues of data access. How is that playing into the general plan of tracking Earth's dynamics? So uh, th that's a very interesting conversation. And it's one that I've been having with multiple people in recent months and weeks. Um, I, the, the business case for private satellites usually comes down to uh, providing a specific, spe specificity of data that is not being provided by uh, the, uh, the NASA or the ESA uh, efforts. Uh, one example is, is GHGSAT, where uh, they have a very narrow swath and they're looking at very, very uh, small uh, footprint uh, um, uh, methane plumes, for instance. Uh, and their business plan is to sell that information to the people that are producing those plumes so they can fix it, right? So pipeline operators, mining operators, um, oil and gas uh, 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 companies and, and the like. And that seems to be a reasonable business plan, right? So uh, this is not something that we can do uh, at that specificity if we want to have a global picture of everything that's going on, right? But if you want to target it to just a few spaces, uh, then uh, then there's room to do that. And I think that uh, you know the the, the the amount of compromise that needs to be made to get anything launched uh, by a government agency means that there are multiple different choices that you could have made if you wanted to measure something else and if you had a different reason to be measuring it. And what I would hope is that while people are going to do that, uh, they're going to measure something different and they're going to measure something hopefully complementary uh, that after it's served its business case, that then that becomes available uh, to be kind of integrated into our larger understanding uh, of what's going on. Uh, but that's, that, that's, 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 those are a lot of conversations uh, that need to happen and, uh, and they need to happen at a higher level than, than, I'm, uh, than I'm privy to. But you see that not as instead of what NASA would do in the future, but as something that's more specialized, what you're saying. I mean, it's, it seems clear to me that if I'm gonna put something in space, there's a thousand different ways that I could do it uh, that would have different uh, outcomes. Uh, and what NASA puts into space or what ESA puts into space uh, is a process of multiple compromises around the technology and around the needs and around the, uh, the, the user base and the stakeholders. Uh, if you had different stakeholders and a different user base and a different need, you would come up with different choices. And so I, I don't see that as, as problematic, uh, you know, unless the, the, the sky gets so crowded that they're crashing into each other. Um, but, uh, but I think it should be complementary because you're not going to come to the same, uh, basic compromise that, that NASA would come to, or the ESA would come to. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Our next question will come from Rob Farrell. Hey, Gavin. Thank you very much for that, uh, nice presentation. For those of us that don't deal with huge data sets, like you folks must deal with all the time. 
Um, a couple of us are interested in how one goes from uh, a generalized model of climate change to being able to attribute to humans uh, a specific event or a smaller event like a heat wave. Can you, can you speak to the computation and theory behind how you go from sort of large global scale data sets to attribution on a smaller scale like that? Right. Uh, so attribution is always a model based endeavor, right? Because, you know, you're, 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 you're saying, well, um, if this is because of this, if I take that away, then not, that isn't going to happen. Uh, and that requires a counterfactual, right? So you have to, you have to be able to, to simulate that. Uh, and you can't just look at the, uh, you can't just look at the observations because obviously the observations just happen once. When it comes to to extreme events, um, uh, there are there are there, depending on the kinds of extreme. So for uh, for for heat waves, um, the models that we have uh, that that kind of run through the historical period, uh, you can just ask them. You know, uh, as the temperatures are, are, are rising, you know, are you seeing more and more heat waves, and what kind of heat waves, and what kind of duration, and what kind of cumulative intensity yeah, you can see? And what you find is that that yes, uh, you see an increasing area that's covered in uh, in heat waves, much greater than than you would have expected in, under climatology, if you have uh, increases in greenhouse gases, uh, but not otherwise. Uh, the same thing is true for intense precipitation in general, in a kind of statistical sense. You can see that coming out of those uh, those basic models uh, without uh, without really having to do very much extra work. Uh, when it comes to something like the rainfall associated with Hurricane Harvey, uh, it's a slightly different uh, issue because obviously uh, a hurricane is a very uh, a very very intense um, and uh, you, to, to get that right uh, you need a, a different class of model you need you need a, a model that uh, that has higher resolution uh, perhaps uh, you know a better convection resolving uh, model or something like that uh, and there you have to do it in a, in a slightly different way and there what they do is um, you take uh, the situation that you observe, the sea surface temperatures that you observe, the, the background atmospheric state that you observe, um, and then you see how many times you get an intense event like that. What's, what's, the, what's the distribution of, of that event's intensity in terms of rainfall? Um, and then you do a, another set of ensembles where you you take the, the, the Gulf of Mexico temperatures and you cool them down to what they were in the 1960s. Um, and you say, okay, well, under those circumstances, uh, what's the distribution of intensity uh, if I start off with that same storm um, uh, in, the, in the main development region? And there you get a, di a difference and you run it enough times that you can kind of fill out the tail uh, of that uh, of that distribution, uh, and that can that can be hundreds of times. You're going to do that, maybe even thousands of times, um, and then you and then you can say, okay, well, on average, you know, the situation where you had the uh, the, the non warmed ocean, uh, you know, it happens. You know, you get you get. Eight, eight inches less rainfall uh, on average than, than, than you would do in the current situation. Uh, and so you can kind of piece together an attribution like that. Thank you. Actually, that last little bit on the, the Harvey um, discussion, I think clarified for me personally, the notion that you go back and you experiment with the data from the past and that, yep. that helps inform your current model. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Gavin. Our next question comes from Steve Running. Hi, Gavin. Um, is there a new understanding about how rapidly atmospheric CO2 would stabilize if the big if we reduced emissions drastically? It seems like I'm seeing some new ideas that equilibration would be way quicker than our earlier models thought it would. Well, I, 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 the conversation has shifted, but the conversation has shifted because I think, you know, 20 years ago, we were talking about something a little bit different to, to what we're talking about now. So uh, if, you, if your question is, well, 
if we, if we cut emissions by a large fraction, uh, would carbon dioxide stabilize? And the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, if we cut emissions by about 80% in total, so of the 10 gigatons of carbon uh, that we're putting into the atmosphere, if we cut that down to about two gigatons of carbon, then carbon dioxide uh, levels in the atmosphere would stabilize. Temperatures would continue to go up. Um, uh, and temperatures would continue to go up until basically uh, carbon dioxide levels, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, go to zero. Uh, and that, at which point you would start to see a slow decline in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, if we go back 20 years to what people were talking about in terms of what we had in the pipeline, uh, all of those kinds of conversations uh, were not really based on an emissions idea, but more on a concentrations idea. If we kept the concentration of everything uh, at the same uh, as it was in the year 2000, uh, then you would still see continued warming. Right, but but maintaining carbon dioxide concentrations uh, is is a cut of roughly eighty percent in terms of emissions. Uh, what people are talking about now is moving towards net zero, which is a hundred percent cut uh, in net carbon dioxide emissions. And so that's a slightly different question, and one would anticipate uh, that the. Uh, uh, the, the, the temperature changes uh, are going to be smaller in, in this latter net zero case than they were in the um, uh, you know, constant concentration cases that people used to talk about. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to take a question from the audience. Besides rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, what are institutions with the power doing to pressure policymakers to follow the science? Um, so I'm, I'm still a federal civil servant, and, uh, and though I'm, I'm advising people on climate science, um, what I can say is that people are now asking for our advice on climate science, uh, which they weren't for a while. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, I think, a newly invigorated push uh, from the executive branch uh, to uh, do more on climate across a whole uh, swath of, uh, of areas. I mean, so uh, at NASA, you know, we've been tasked with um, doing a better job on reducing our institutional uh, carbon footprint. Uh, we've been tasked on uh, making sure that our facilities are more resilient um, and that we understand the vulnerabilities and we're going to update all of those uh, vulnerabilities in the light of new information. Uh, but also we're, we're being asked to make sure that the science that we do is going to the people that could use it uh, and that we're involved in in multiple um, efforts to to inform decision makers or to help decision makers uh, make decisions uh, based on the observations that we're that we're that we're making but also our analyses and also our forward models uh, for what's going to happen or what could happen uh, under various scenarios uh, so uh, you know I, I can't speak for for a very wide group of, uh, of people but uh, the uh, the efforts that the the U.S. science uh, establishments uh, are making are being seen uh, and being used um, uh, and will be used and be seen uh, much more strongly, I think, in the next uh, few years than they have been uh, up until now. Wonderful. One last question. Is it possible to predict flooding or drought intensity in advance from the images for emergency preparedness purposes? Uh, it depends on the time scale and it depends on the uh, the places that, that you're looking at. So uh, we can uh, we can predict uh, you know for places that are that are strongly affected by uh, El Nino events, uh, we can predict uh, drought and flooding and wildfires you know six months a, a ahead of time. So we'll be uh, we'll be able to predict you know what's what's going to be happening uh, in the in the fall or you know or next year um, in Indonesia, in South America, in Australia. Um, uh, quite well. Um, predicting something like uh, floods associated with early snowpack melts in, in the Mississippi Basin, that's a much harder 
uh, prediction to make that's much more dependent on the uh, the vagaries of uh, of uh, extra tropical weather, uh, and that uh, that doesn't uh, that that isn't so easy to do um, uh, months in advance. Uh, but but I mean I mean these things these things are predictable um, in uh, the, the weather forecast time scale. Uh, uh, you know the, the the cold snap in 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 Texas uh, was predicted uh, many days before it arrived, uh, and uh, and so you know and and the and the warm the warm temperatures in Siberia in the summer were predicted many days before they arrived. Uh, so um, it, it depends a little bit on on where you are, on what you're trying to predict, and. Uh, uh, and, and what your your needed time scale is. Uh, there are some things we just won't ever be able to do, uh, but but where we can do things, we're doing we're doing a better job now than we were. Wonderful. Well, we uh, are up on the hour, and it was an incredible ride, Gavin. Uh, it went so quickly. I want to really thank you for uh, this presentation, and uh, it was very informative. For folks online, we will be posting this video for you to watch again. And with Gavin's permission, we will also post his slides. Uh, they were incredible. With that, I just want to thank you all for the Space Studies Board and Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board at the National Academy of Sciences. And please stay safe.